What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we're going to be dangerous. We are going to cover the original Watchmen comic and Doomsday Clock at the same time. And I don't know why I think this is a good idea, <laughs> but I think it is. I think it's a good idea. Now, we did part one a while ago, and people were asking, where's Watchmen part two? Honestly, I was waiting for Doomsday Clock to drop because it seems like it'd be the only time to cover it. It's like Infinity War, right? Like Infinity War, the best time to cover it is when everybody's searching for it, when the movie comes out. Now, with regards to the first Watchmen comic, the first one of the things we talked about was that it was laying the groundwork in a lot of ways for the characters, who they are, what they were doing. We really followed Warshack, different things like that. Issue number two, I think, is probably one of like the defining parts of the comic, because what it focuses on is the idea of who the characters are as individuals. And that's the cool thing, because when it comes to Alan Moore's Watchmen, it's not like a traditional superhero comic that you read right now. And the first comic we talked about, it was the death of the comedian. And that's what set in motion the idea of Rorschach trying to find out who killed the comedian. And so that's what set us on this path of everything that goes on in this particular story. But with the death of Eddie Blake, there are a myriad of things going on. When it comes to Silk Spectre, you know, for example, visiting her mother, in a lot of ways, if you watch the movie, it was the whole idea of her mom was just kind of like, hey, you don't understand what the world is like. And, you know, it's it's Silk Spectre just kind of being like, yeah, I do understand what it's like and, you know, so on and so forth. But the cool thing about this is that it's not necessarily just Sally Jupiter's just fighting with her daughter. It's this whole idea of the nature of people. When you have Sally Jupiter arguing with her daughter and the whole idea is that Sally Jupiter is kind of showing her daughter the fact that people send her pinups and they send like, you know, artistic drawings and things like that. Sally Jupiter is actually welcoming to it, where her daughter is more like, that's disgusting. That's basically people sending you images that shouldn't be considered flattering because it's more insulting than anything else. But it's two different ideologies that are conflicting with one another. When it comes to Sally Jupiter, she's kind of old hat with regards to how she views herself and how she views the world. In her mind, it is considered to be a flattering thing because really in a lot of ways, she's kind of living in the past. She's sort of surrounded by this nostalgia. She used to be a superhero once, you know, she was super attractive in her youth, you know, really kind of appealing to these ideas. People hey, who say, look, man, you were gorgeous back in the day, surrounds herself with a sort of adoration that she used to get, but doesn't get anymore. And that's the nature of people. We as people in a lot of ways look to the past. We look to where things used to be, kind of looking to a better day, so on and so forth. And so it's kind of cool. But with Silk Spectre herself, she's more of a generation of empowerment, where this kind of thing is more demeaning than anything else. People shouldn't necessarily be defined by how it is that they look. But on the other side of the equation, Silk Spectre's not without her faults, and her mom points this out. Her mom's like, look, the only reason why you're paired up with Dr. Manhattan is to basically just sleep with him, is to keep him quote unquote comfortable. And that's the crazy thing about this, is because in some ways it's true. And actually we're gonna see that whole dynamic to a degree begin to unfold. But something that I wanna point out here is that while, you know, Silk Spectre's sort of ranting and raving to her mom about all these things, one of the things that happens is we sort of get this flashback to the idea where Eddie Blake had tried to force himself onto Sally Jupiter. Now, of course, a lot of people remember this from the movie. And it is kind of a, a strange scenario because this is one of those situations where her mom argues that the world's not necessarily as black and white as her daughter would like to believe. You know, where Silk Spectre would like to believe there's good guys or bad guys, done, everything's copacetic for the most part. The idea of a Sally Jupiter is saying, but it's not that way. It's wisdom versus youth. It is, there's, there's black, there's white, and then there's all the shades in between. And emotions only make things even more complicated than that. When you have someone like Eddie Blake who forces himself onto Sally, uh, Sally Jupiter, at that point it becomes about power. And with Eddie Blake being as unstable as he seemed to be in a lot of ways, then it's not necessarily a thing of, oh my God, I can't believe he did that to me. At this point, it puts Sally Jupiter in a state of fear for the most part. And that sets the stage for things that come later on down the line. But again, moving through this whole idea of going into the, to the concept of people in general, in terms of how they function, the various members of the Watchmen, this switches over to really one of the first major meetings is a flashback from Ozymandias with the Watchmen group as a whole. Everybody's sort of looking around and paying attention and seeing what's going on. Whereas you have Eddie Blake, who's just sort of blowing it all off. And that's the funny thing. People really, in a lot of ways, looked at Eddie Blake as a guy who was just a total jerk. Not necessarily. When it came to the character of Eddie Blake, his whole philosophy was that the world is just kind of a joke, that people are who they are, that they're flawed, they're screwed up, that they're messed up. But the only way to really maintain your sanity, the only way to really function is to just kind of laugh at it. And that's why he says this whole idea of the Watchmen is nonsense, because you're not going to change the hearts and minds of people. If people wanted to change, they would have changed already. And so instead, it's the Watchmen just kind of coming together and fighting this feudal fight. It's a bunch of people running around in masks, 
thinking they can change the world when in actuality they can't putting on costumes dressing up as superheroes and fighting crime doesn't change anything it takes the responsibility off of traditional people and puts it on the shoulders of those who are willing to take up costumes and so again switching over to dr manhattan we jump to basically the whole vietnam conflict eddie blake and dr manhattan in a bar you know coming at the war's close and the whole idea here is that again he seems to be almost like a sociopath in this particular instance you know some pregnant woman walks up you know hey look the child's yours and his idea is it ain't mine i don't care i'm leaving this place it doesn't matter and that's what's so crazy about his character is he seems so removed from traditional society so removed from people that he doesn't even care that he has a child we find this out because once he insults this girl and she slashes him across the face of the bottle he shoots her in the head and this brings into sharp fruition not only the nature of dr manhattan but the nature of eddie blake himself in the sense that where eddie blake's just kind of like look i'm leaving this place i don't care like you were a means to an end who cares what happens to you the crazy thing is that dr manhattan is almost the exact same way. That's the whole case that Eddie Blake makes to Manhattan. When Manhattan's like, you just, you, you gunned down a pregnant woman. He's like, yeah, and you could have done anything to stop me. You could have done any number of things to keep this from happening, but you didn't. And that's the nature of Dr. Manhattan within the realm of the Watchmen. Dr. Manhattan views the world in the Watchmen universe in relation to himself. You know, Manhattan's like, I'm more powerful than any being that could ever exist. I can wipe out the world if I wanted to. For him, watching humanity go about its musings and meandering Wandering around and doing whatever it is that it does would be like you concerning yourselves with an anthill. Of what difference does it serve? And that's how Dr. Manhattan views people. They're insignificant. They're unimportant. And so again, this goes on into the nature of Eddie Blake. When we pick up with Night Owl, we pick up with the you know all these protests and things like that, and Eddie Blake's response to it. When Eddie Blake looks at people, he's just like, you don't do anything of any real measure, of any real note. And this this really comes into sharp relief when he jumps into a crowd and starts firing on people. You know, because the whole idea is, yeah, people are all about changing things until it gets too dangerous. And then you want to run. Like you want to just, just run away and run away and let somebody else solve the problem. That's the nature of this whole thing. That's the philosophy of it all. That's why I say Alan Moore's Watchmen is really intriguing because the whole story is a, is basically a philosophical critique on normal society. If these protesters really believed in what they were protesting, they'd give their lives for it, but they don't. They're protesting only so far as it's easy to do. You know, and so again, that's the crazy thing about all this is it's a critique of society. And so ultimately this all boils down to the idea of Rorschach watching all these events unfold, keeping an eye on everything that's going on. But for him, one of the first things he does is he basically tracks down Moloch. Now, of course, Moloch was a guy that had faced off against, you know, a comedian on several occasions back when they were younger. The problem with this is that Moloch is basically dying. But one of the things that he talks about is that Eddie Blake had basically come to visit him. And Eddie Blake was basically losing his mind. He was rambling on, you know, referring to it all being a joke and so on and so forth. And again, that's how this works. Eddie Blake was looking at humanity and saying, dude, it's it's all a joke. It's all just some crazy joke. But he's not talking about, man, this is just so funny and humanity's just so screwed. You know, it's just weird. For him, he's learned something. He's learned that a plan is in the works. And that's how he copes. Referring to it as a joke, referring to it as being silly, laughing at it is how he deals with the nature of the world. And that is the core principle of the nature of the comedian. He laughs about every problem that he has. You could take this exact same philosophy and like apply it to the Joker. I mean, you could apply it to the early days of the Joker. So much backstory and so much involvement has been done in the Joker over the years that he's almost nothing like the comedian. But, you know, in the early days when he was still somewhat of an enigma, you could apply that concept to him. It's just how he copes. But the way the comedian deals with things is the way that people deal with things. It's kind of the idea that people deal with things by not necessarily facing them in a lot of ways. That if I laugh at it, if I consider it a joke, then I can maintain my sanity in a world that has otherwise gone mad, that's filled with hypocritical people, crooked politicians, the whole nine yards. The crazy thing about this is that in this meeting that he has with Moloch, basically sort of losing his mind, it's almost like he's rethinking thinking his life philosophy because of what he's learned. What's what's so funny about all this? What's so hilarious about all this? It's basically just sort of like this mental breakdown. You know, he runs over all the things that he's done, heinous things to kids. He's done heinous things to women, things that he regrets. But for him, it didn't seem to matter at the time anyway, because he was just blending in with a mad world. And so it didn't really matter. But having seen what he's seen, it gives him pause for thought. What kind of world are we living in where this sort of thing is okay? And with what's coming later on down the line, with what he knows he can't stop, how's the world going to cope. And so, of course, with Rorschach basically getting the, the last little tidbits of the story and basically bailing out, one of the things that he does is he goes back and he visits the grave of Eddie Blake. 
Now, this is one of the coolest parts of the story, I think, this monologue of Rorschach that goes on here. Because one of the things that he does is he gives us like his insight into the world in a lot of ways. And he did that in the first part, you know, and he'll do that over the course of the story. Where Eddie Blake copes with the world by basically saying, yeah, the world's mad, but the only way to really deal with it is to just laugh at it. For Rorschach, it's not really a laughing matter. He's just kind of like, this is how the world is. He's very cynical in that regard, in the sense people are just bad. People are inherently bad, but that's just the nature of people. This eventual breakdown of society, this quote unquote end of all things, that's going to happen because people are just like that. People just do bad things. It's just the nature of people. He accepts that. All he sees is the negativity in the world. And so when he goes and he looks at the grave of Eddie Blake, he gives us this sort of monologue that, you know, is this really what, what the destiny awaits for everybody who's part of the Watchmen, for everybody who does what they do? Is it just the nature of who they are? Is it just the idea that their actions will always bring violence? Is there something in their personality that invites that kind of violence? Is it just the nature of who they are as people? And so it's incredibly well done because what he says is that Eddie Blake understood that the nature of people is violent, but the only way for him to deal with it was to just kind of make a joke out of it, to laugh at it. But in his mind, in the mind of Eddie Blake, Blake saw the nature of people and he decided to become a parody of it, to become a mockery of it. That's why he was so violent that in his mind, if humanity is going to be this incredibly terrible, the only way to cope with that is to laugh about it. Maybe that's just the way this goes. Maybe this is the fate that inevitably awaits us all. You know, maybe Dr. Manhattan will find his end in some form or fashion, assuming somebody can pull it off. So Spectre, Night Owl, Rorschach himself, it's the end that they all wait for. And it makes sense because if you go back and you look at the members of the Minutemen, most all of them met their end in a pretty gruesome way. I mean, Mothman was thrown in an insane asylum. Hollis Mason made it out and, you know, Sally Jupiter kind of made it out to a degree, but it's not like they made it out and they were celebrated by humanity. It's not like Sally Jupiter, you know, finished her tenure as a superhero and humanity was like, all right, you're going to be set up in the most lavish of places that could ever exist. And we're going to make sure that you never want for anything in your whole life. She's just living in some retirement community upstate somewhere. People look at her as like, yeah, she was a hero once. Cool. And that's it. One of two fates awaits us. Either it's just some grisly death at the hands of some villain somewhere who's going around sniffing out Watchmen or meandering throughout the rest of our lives. And then that's really about it. There's no great story to be told. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.